Maria? Greetings to everyone present in this panel and to those who listen to us on the internet. Greetings is a polysemic word spoken in a moment when we meet or say goodbye. It carries with it a gesture of welcome and courtesy, a sign of respect and care, an indication of goodwill and admiration. In some languages, it means long live life or to life. It is in this spirit that I say everyone gathered here, greetings. The topics that will be addressed today are a result of years of creativity, herein presented in a succinct and brilliant way. It is impossible to imagine the extent of work and dedication, as well as the changes and transformations that have occurred in the course of so many years of research that made it possible for this achievement to be shared with us in this symposium. Talking about trends as embodiment of being, more than seeing the world from the point of view of individual self, is to adopt another formula in which the world becomes conscious of itself, or the world recognizes itself, as Kitaro Nishida posits. In the sense, this consciousness of being in the world and being the world, far from being mystified, is to be felt through a direct experience, an experience commonly named absolute void, no thing, the profound foundation of being. This means knowing the facts as they are without adding any measure of judgment or discrimination or any of our elaborations. To experience the embodiment of being, it is to experience a state of consciousness of direct nature, where there is neither subject nor object, quite distant from the indirect experiences we attest in the disciplinary universe. However complex, the experience of the embodiment of being may be in itself universal, simple, singular, unifying, and attuned to attention and to the instant. Trends as embodiment of being is an invitation to a banquet, to be enjoyed in our intimacy as a unifying activity that happens in agreement with feeling, with our inclination to access our ultimate possibilities, and perhaps to see them transpire in our actions. Certainly, this is a genuine dynamic movement of transdisciplinary nature. Welcome you all to the symposium. I now pass the floor to Susanna Hayes, who will present to the speakers and moderate the session. Enjoy it, and let's keep going. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Maria, for that lovely introduction. And welcome, Harold Terry Lindahl, Julieta. I'll start right in with my um, introductions of Jennifer Gidley, who is 
in Australia and not able to join us directly. So we will have Today is the second day of our trans embodiment of being session. My name is Susanna Hayes. I am an artist and educator based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I received my MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute and my doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley. I want to thank the Congress Leadership Committees, Siret, Florent Pasquar, Basarab Nicolesco, Maria and Victoria from C-Trans Brazil, UNESCO, Palo Orfis, and Juliet Hadar in Mexico City. I'd also like to say much thanks to the Entropy, Entropy Institute for their support during this past year to help make this program happen. Our symposium today is titled The Future of Education. Our first presenter will be Dr. Jennifer Gidley from Sydney, Australia, a pre recorded video. Then Harold Terry Lindahl will speak from the United States in San Francisco. And he will be joined in a conversation with Dr. Stephen Porges following Maria DeMello's invited response. Dr. Jennifer Gidley's talk title is Educational Futures. Transdisciplinary Pedagogies of Love, Life, Wisdom, and Voice. Her talk rests on the assumption that human consciousness is evolving beyond the boundaries of formal reductionist thinking and the siloism of disciplinary knowledge. She draws on transdisciplinary concepts such as integral theory, post-formal psychology, and planetary consciousness to explore educational futures in the light of the evolution of consciousness. She identifies four core pedagogical values that emerge in the space beyond reductionist skill sets and subject categorization, love, life, wisdom, and voice. While these core values can be explored philosophically and theoretically, she will focus on their embodiment through examples from the art of education. Since uh, Dr. Gidley provides a full history of educational futures with her own personal involvement in biography, I'll now ask Tilio to start her video. Hello, I'm Jennifer Gidley and I'm speaking to you today from Australia about educational futures, the transdisciplinary pedagogies of love, life, wisdom and voice. I'm thrilled to be speaking at the World Congress on Transdisciplinarity and I want to thank Susanna and all the organisers for enabling me to be present and participating in this amazing Congress. I've been a futures researcher for over 20 years and was honoured this year to be included in the Forbes list of the world's top 50 women futurists. For eight years I was president of the World Future Studies Federation, which is a UNESCO partner and the global peak body for future scholars across 60 countries. The Federation was founded in Paris in 1973 by some of the 20th century's leading futures thinkers. The purpose was to democratise futures thinking. As president, I was privileged to work with many of the world's foremost future scholars. And during this time, I led the creation of UNESCO-funded leadership programs designed to empower young people in a range of developing countries. 
draw on my work as an international futurist, but also on my 40 years experience as a psychologist, educator and academic. My Oxford book, The Future, A Very Short Introduction, is a great companion volume. So my presentation will take about 40 minutes. I have a PowerPoint which is probably more dense and full than I'll be able to say in the, in the 40 minutes. So I'll be providing you with the PowerPoint. So if I skip over things, don't worry, you'll have a copy later. So let's go. Educational Futures and Evolution of Consciousness, The Relationship. I'm going to read a brief quote from my book, Post Formal Education. The evolution of human culture and with it human consciousness is intimately interwoven with the development of speech, language and writing. All of this has over millennia been part of the enculturation of children, which later became known as education. The factory model of education is obsolete. Interestingly, the model of education that's been going on for the last couple of hundred years, which more or less came out of the British Industrial Revolution, was not the first form of universal education. The first form of universal education was developed in Germany and it was really based on a view of human beings which was very full and rich and evolving and it was inspired by the, the work of the German idealists and romantic philosophers who had a, a concept of evolution of consciousness and the education that Humboldt and others developed to be universal education was about developing the whole person, educating the whole human being, Bildung model, which was hijacked by the factory approach of the British Industrial Revolution. That model was imported to America and, and now we're importing that same factory model to many other parts of the world and it's all about training for jobs. And as futurists, we know that the jobs you train people for today certainly won't be there in 20 years' time. So I'm a very big advocate of transforming education so that it's probably more closely resembling the original building model developed a couple of hundred years ago than what we have today. One advantage of the change in the UN's development goals is that the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, were focused on the quantity, getting children in school. But then they realised that quality was important as well. So the Sustainable Development Goals now are more about quality, not just numbers on seats. So today we're going to be speaking about, firstly, the evidence for the evolution of consciousness. I'll cover this briefly, but you can look at the details later. Secondly, I'll look at two streams of the evolution of consciousness, cultural history and developmental psychology. Thirdly, I'll focus on these transdisciplinary pedagogies of love, life, wisdom and voice and how they relate to the evolution of consciousness. And finally, I'll focus on embodying these core values and helping you to do so to meet the 21st century challenges. So evidence for the evolution of consciousness can be found all across the 20th century. I did some research on what I called the megatrends of the mind in 2010 and I published a piece called Globally Scanning for Megatrends of the Mind, Potential Futures of Futures Thinking, published in Futures. It discusses a number of changes that we've seen. Firstly, evolution within scholarly disciplines. All of the major disciplines science, philosophy, education and psychology have all evolved quite dramatically over the last hundred years. Secondly, evolution is moving beyond disciplinary boundaries. We're seeing expanding disciplinary boundaries through interdisciplinary studies, cross-disciplinary and transdisciplinary research, hence this amazing global conference on transdisciplinarity that we're all taking part in for over 12 month period. We see expanding concepts of time, such as big history, macro history and future studies. And we have expanding concepts of space, from outer space to inner space, and planetary consciousness. Thirdly, there are evolutionary concepts now that theorise paradigm change. These are adult developmental psychology, cultural history and cultural evolution, and of course the evolution of consciousness discourse itself. We'll focus a little more on these in the next section. Fourthly, there are transversal concepts that metacohere new knowledge. These three I focus on are integral studies, which tends to emphasize the crisis in worldview, the 
need for paradigm change and to promote integral thinking both individually and culturally. Secondly, post-formal psychology includes 40 years of empirical and theoretical research, largely in the USA, on higher stages of reasoning and is now growing in Europe and Australia and elsewhere. Thirdly, planetary consciousness, the third transversal evolutionary concept, emphasizes the urgency of transnational collaboration around our planetary crises, ecological, politico-economic and socio-cultural. So to summarize the evidence for the evolution of consciousness, all the scholarly disciplines are evolving. Transdisciplinarity is growing, concepts of time and space are expanding. Evolution of consciousness is expressed through cultural history and adult developmental psychology, particularly post-formal psychology. And new knowledge can be cohered through post-formal integral and planetary studies. I'm now going to look at the two streams of evolution of consciousness or the two faces of evolution of consciousness. These are integral culture, the new emerging culture of our era, and post-formal psychology, higher cognition, that developmental psychologists call post-formal reasoning. So firstly, looking at cultural evolution. Humans have evolved culturally over millennia, not in a linear way, lockstep, complexly and recursively, but we're reaching a time where we are facing and integrating or embracing integral culture. In the 18th century in Europe, German idealists such as Goethe, Schelling and many others were already writing about the evolution of consciousness. Schelling was writing about conscious evolution, which we hear about today. But in 19th century Europe, the whole discourse on evolution was hijacked by Darwinism, which became a scientific approach and biological approach to evolution. In early 20th century Europe, Rudolf Steiner was writing about evolution of consciousness from 1904, and Sri Aurobindo in India from 1914. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin and Jean Gebser and many others were beginning to focus on these various concepts of evolution of consciousness. From the mid 20th to 21st century, in a global context, we now have our contemporaries, integral theorists such as Ken Wilber, adult developmental psychologists such as Jan Sinnott, transdisciplinary theorists such as Irvin Laszlo, and futures researchers and psychologists such as myself have all been writing about evolution of consciousness in the last 20 to 50 years. So we'll focus a little now on Jean Gebser's cultural evolution. Jean Gebser was a Polish-Swiss cultural historian. His seminal work was The Ever-Present Origin, an amazing book. He's one of the most important cultural historians of the 20th century. He developed an overview of cultural history. Uh, he didn't talk about evolution, he spoke about uh, mutating structures of consciousness over time. He focused on archaic consciousness in prehistory, magic consciousness in the Ice Age to the Agrarian Age, mythical consciousness from the Agrarian to 800 BCE, and mental rational mode of consciousness from around the time of the Greek philosophers and mathematicians to the Renaissance in 1500 CE. He then posited that integral consciousness began to emerge in around 1500 and that it's been continually emerging at the leading edge of society and culture among leading edge individuals until the present time and will continue long into the future. The most important thing we need to know from Gebser is that in the current cultural era, we are transitioning between the dominance of mental rational thinking or formal binary logic and the emergence of more complex, creative and integrative logics or post-formal logics. But to understand post-formal psychology, we need to know about developmental psychology and particularly the theories of Jean Piaget. So from the perspective of psychological development, Jean Piaget was also one of the most important psychologists of the 20th century. His seminal book, The Child's Construction of Reality, focused on four developmental stages in a child's life sensory motor in the infant, pre-operational from two to six years, concrete operations from seven to 12 years, and what he called formal operations from 12 to 18 years. However, Piaget basically stopped there. Although he did in some of his later writings flag the possibility that reasoning went further, he didn't theorize or empirically research anything more than formal operations. 
But since the 70s, adult developmental psychologists, particularly beginning with the US, have recognised higher stages of reasoning. And they call this post-formal reasoning or mature adult reasoning. The important thing to know about psychological development from Jean Piaget is that today, advanced individuals are in transition between the dominance of formal thinking or formal binary logic and the emergence of more complex, creative, integrative or post-formal logics. I now want to introduce Professor of Psychology at Towson University in the US, Jan Sinnott. She's a very important adult developmental psychologist of the 20th and 21st century. Professor Sinnott wrote the book, The Development of Logic in Adulthood, Postformal Thought and Its Applications, and she wrote it in 1998. And she put forward, along with uh, several other psychologists and theorists at the time, the concept of postformal reasoning, or sometimes called post-operational thinking or postformal logics. So it includes such qualities as complexity, creativity, paradox, reflexivity, relativism, spirituality and wisdom. If we look now at a, an isomorphic parallel between Jean Gebser and Piaget and Sinnott, we see amazing parallels between the cultural history of Jean Gebser and the developmental psychology approaches of Piaget when we include the postformal uh, psychologists of positing postformal reasoning as well. And of course, Ken Wilber and Rudolf Steiner and others also uh, integrated these, uh, these cultural evolution and developmental psychology approaches in their work. And I do in mine as well. But now we'll go back to postformal reasoning. We're going to now look at evolution of consciousness from the perspective of postformal psychology. Postformal reasoning is the most widely used term to denote higher developmental stages beyond Piaget's formal operations. In my PhD research, I undertook to study the work of all the uh, adult developmental psychologists and others working in that field. And there's, there's a couple of dozen uh, features, qualities, aspects that have been identified by these psychologists in their research that they identify with post-formal reasoning or mature adult reasoning. What I did in my work was to cluster these, these couple of dozen qualities into 12 clusters, which I call post-formal reasoning qualities. More about this can be found in my book, Post-Formal Education. So briefly identifying them here as complexity, creativity, dialogical reasoning, ecological reasoning, futures reasoning and higher purpose, and then imagination, integration, intuitive wisdom, language reflexivity, pluralism and reflexivity. What I continue to do with my, in my PhD research was then look at the emerging alternative and innovative educational approaches in the late 20th and early 21st century and identified what I called post-formal pedagogies or evolutionary pedagogies. So I claimed the term post-formal education, which had been previously used by Joe Kincherlow and Shirley Steinberg in their work, which was more about critical pedagogy, and I identified all these educational approaches, which I called post-formal educational approaches. Instead of reading through these, I'm going to go to the next section where I found amazing parallels between post-formal reasoning qualities and the emerging post-formal educational approaches. For each one of these clusters of post-formal reasoning qualities, I found clusters of innovative educational approaches, which when operating as they were designed to do, will help to develop these post-formal reasoning qualities as children grow into mature adults. So you can study this chart later because I want to move on now and discuss these in more detail. So as part of my research, I also focused on these post-formal reasoning qualities and I found that out of those emerged four themes, evolutionary themes, and I named them love, life, wisdom and voice. The theme of love was looking at qualities, post-formal qualities, which focused on conscious, compassionate and spiritual development. The life theme focused on mobile, organic and life-enhancing thinking. The wisdom theme was focused on complexification in thinking and culture. 
and the voice theme focused on linguistic and paradigmatic boundary crossing, quite complex. Furthermore, when I looked at the post-formal and evolutionary pedagogies, I found the same themes, the same evolutionary themes mapped onto those educational approaches. So I was able to create a chart looking at the educational approaches, these post-formal pedagogies, and look at how they clustered around these, these four themes of love, life, wisdom and voice. Of course, this is not an exact mapping or an exact reductionist scientific approach. These are clusters and these are ways of looking at educational approaches, ways of looking at evolution of consciousness, which are resonating with each other and synchronizing with each other. So in our journey today, I'm now going to focus more directly on these transdisciplinary pedagogies of love, life, wisdom and voice. I see pedagogical love as an evolutionary force, pedagogical life as a sustaining force, pedagogical wisdom as a creative force and pedagogical voice as an empowering force. So what educational approaches help to foster pedagogical love? They are caring approaches that warm education. They're approaches that develop reverence, care, they integrate heart and hand, and they include approaches such as spiritual, transformative and contemplative education, social and emotional education, and integral and holistic education. And here are some practical things that warm the children's hearts. Educators can acknowledge each individual child as a presence. They can connect authentically. You can nurture your children with beauty. You can develop community among your students and you can encourage cooperation and collaboration and importantly you can take care of yourself as teachers you need to practice self-love so grow your own wisdom and your own aesthetic development model practical love and respect focus on intangibles such as meditation and importantly inspire a love of learning i've found that pedagogical love fosters the post-formal qualities that are found in the theme that develops conscious, compassionate spiritual development. These are the post-formal reasoning qualities of higher purpose, dialogical reasoning, valuing the other, and integration or holistic thinking. I'm now going to look at pedagogical life. What educational approaches help to foster this? enlivening approaches that revitalize education. The educational approaches that we focus on with, within pedagogical life are imaginative education, ecological, environmental and sustainable education, and futuresome foresight education. There are practical ways to bring teaching to life. Firstly, develop your own imagination, stretch yourselves, use storytelling, Make it up, but make it relevant. We know that the image world, the media, the mass media is full of a lot of negative images that young people are affected by, they're, they're depressed by, they get a sense of hopelessness from the negativity in the media. So we need to focus on countering these negatives. You need to develop positive imagery for the young people Introduce them to positive things happening in the world. This is what we need to do to counter the negatives. Uh, practical ways to enliven the curriculum. Creative handwork. Creative, organic, out-of-the-box architecture helps them to think out-of-the-box. Rhyme and rhythm. Cycles of nature. Practice nature care. Looking after gardens, growing vegetables, herbs, flowers. So if we develop pedagogical life in children, we will help them to develop mobile life enhancing thinking. So as adults, they will have imagination. They will have a sense of ecological reasoning and futures reasoning. Thirdly, pedagogical wisdom. How do we educate for this? We need to use multimodal approaches to create discernment among young people. Wisdom education is about creativity. It's multimodal, it's layered. So there are educational approaches on creativity in education, complexity in education, even wisdom education itself. These are out there in the world. These are individual innovative approaches to education that are already happening. We need to explore these and I cohere them under the pedagogies of wisdom. 
how to be multimodal in your education. It's the bedrock of wisdom. As a teacher myself, as an educator, I danced between subject and context so that the young people saw the interconnectedness between what they were learning and everything else. Conceptually, through imaginative thinking and vitality. Visually, through using pictures, diagrams, getting the children to create artistic activities. Imaginatively, through story, poem, song, dance, role play or experientially through handwork, gardening, excursions, school camps. Then you can cultivate other broad literacies to help create discernment. There is a great value in free and creative play. What about games? Well, there's a lot of discussion about video games because many of them are, are violent, disruptive, but there are altruistic video games. There's, there's a new genre of altruistic digital games. Board games can help to develop systems thinking. And then there are finally some unusual literacies, such as happiness, humour and laughter. Maggie McClure, British educator, talks about frivolity as one of those rare and special literacies we need to develop. So pedagogical wisdom helps to develop complex creativity in young people. It relates to the evolutionary theme of a complexification of thinking and culture. So it develops in adults, creativity, complexity, and even intuitive wisdom. Fourthly and finally, pedagogical voice. How do we educate to foster this? Multivocal approaches nurture empowerment. So to develop the pedagogical voice, we need to focus on those uh, many educational approaches which are multicultural, which help to develop self-reflection, and even to respect silence. Postmodern and post-structuralist pedagogies, aesthetic, artistic and poetic education, critical, post-colonial, global and planetary education. These are all individual educational approaches. There's nine of them there I've just mentioned. They're all operating out there in little pockets in the world and I cohere these under the idea of pedagogical voice. Why is human voice so important in education? because today the human voice is continually mediated by technology. Reliance on technology, we know from research, limits language development in children. Many kindergarten children these days have delayed language. And we know from research also that children exposed to screen-mediated forms of communication become increasingly disconnected. So how do we strengthen human voice to help to empower the children? Many ways, a multitude of ways. Listen to the birds sing. Listen to the wind whistle in the trees, waves break on the shore, a creek, a stream babbling along. Imagine the difference between a joyful teacher starting a class with a song and a cranky teacher ordering children around. We can use poems, we can sing, we can dance, we can have natural conversation. What's wrong with everyday conversation between teachers and students, students and students? We can chant, we can tell stories, we can use wordplay like tongue twisters. And finally, learning a second or third language is brilliant for developing pedagogical voice, for developing multivocality, multicultural sensibility. So I believe pedagogical voice encourages reflective views. It helps encourage in adults reflexivity, including language reflexivity or being aware of what we're saying, and pluralism and multiculturalism. And it relates to the evolutionary theme of linguistic and paradigmatic boundary crossing, which is a very high level of post-formal reasoning. Finally, we're going to look at, as our fourth part of the journey today, embodying these core values to meet the 21st century challenges. What are the key challenges for the 21st century? Climate crisis, how do we educate for this? Growing inequality, how do we counter this? We live in a post-truth world. How do we educate for discernment? And we're facing exponential technology development. How do we keep it human with young people? To embody the core values to meet a 21st century challenge like climate crisis, how do we educate for this? We have sea level rise, we have melting glaciers, we have uh, species extinction, we have mass climate migration. Global environmental challenges, climate crisis. Over 3 billion people live in coastal cities at risk of rising sea levels. 
That's about a third of the population of the Earth. Climate crisis also is doubling the, the extent of wildfires. The research shows in Europe that there's double the amount of wildfires in the last 10 years, which they're attributing to climate change. The Union of Concerned Scientists in the USA is saying the same thing about the Californian wildfires. Wildfires, superstorms, climate crisis is leading us to the brink of ecosystem collapse with out of control wildfires, superstorms and sea level rise beginning to hit home. Seven million people were already displaced in the first half of 2019 because of climate crisis. What values have caused climate crisis? Seems to me we've forgotten to value life, the environment and our future. We don't think in terms of a long-term future for our future generations. But I believe the pedagogies of life can help turn around climate crisis. If young people are educated with imagination, with a sense of ecological sensibility and foresight, a view of long-term futures, they will develop an ecological sensibility that will help them to turn around climate crisis. Next, to embody the core values to meet growing inequality. How do we counter this? Economic disparity. Is that a challenge? Yes, absolutely. Apple, Google, Amazon, Facebook and Microsoft between them have a combined net worth of three trillion US dollars and they're competing at the moment between themselves to be the first one to have a trillion, to be worth a trillion. So they're Apple's new five billion largest office block on earth about to open. Meanwhile, far away from Silicon Valley, the UN Commission on Human Rights tells us that in 2005, 100 million people were homeless worldwide and 1.6 billion lacked adequate housing in 2015. So we have a big challenge and it seems to be widening the gap. We see here Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man and his 165 million Beverly Hills mansion. But many of his Amazon staff are on food stamps. And the Oxford 2018 report tells us that the world's richest 1% got 82% of the wealth generated in 2018. It would be much worse now. We know that during the COVID period, those handful of billionaires got richer, most of them, while people lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods and lost their lives. What do we do about this? What values underlie growing inequality? It seems we've forgotten how to value each other. Greed is at the centre of it. It dominates and a lack of care for our fellow humans. So the pedagogies of love come in here to counter growing inequality. If we educate children through spiritual and contemplative practices, through social and emotional education processes, through holistic and integral education, we are developing compassion and that helps to counter growing inequality. Thirdly, we live in a post-truth world. How do we educate for discernment? In a post-truth world, we need to educate young people to have discernment, to be able to navigate fake news, echo chambers and media monopolies. How do we do this? What values are lacking here? I see primarily a lack of discernment today. There's a proliferation of information through the mass media, but young people don't know how to make sense of it. They don't know how to navigate the masses of information. The pedagogies of wisdom can help here. Educating children in a way that's multimodal, creative, complex, showing interconnectedness. This will all help them to discern truth from post-truth. It will help them to develop wise discernment. Finally, how do we embody the core values to help us meet the 21st century challenge of exponential technologies? digital addiction, AI and cyber threats. How do we keep it human? There's so much media around at the moment saying, AI is going to take your jobs, be afraid. Is AI going to take all our jobs? I don't think so. And the reason is there's a huge discrepancy between the hype about AI and the actual reality. So the hype is we're going to have smart robots giving lectures. Next year, you won't need me to come. You won't need anyone else to come. You'll have a robot here. They'll be giving the lecture and they'll be doing it much better than me. <laughs> the reality is, here's one of Google's robots who was attempting to jump the wall. 
crashing into the wall there. The thing is that even organisations like the Machine Intelligence Research Institute in Massachusetts says on its website, most of what's being said about artificial intelligence approaching general human intelligence is purely science fiction at this point. We're actually nowhere near even human general intelligence, let alone super intelligence. But there is so much in the media at the moment saying that this is all happening and it's going to be happening very soon and we should be worried. So one of the things that worries me about this is not that AI will take over our jobs, but that the tech developers who are working on this have very narrow cultural frameworks. There's a lot of literature on this. They're mostly young white males in, in America. They've, they're self-educated. They haven't studied ethics, they haven't done a general liberal arts degree where they have any philosophy, psychology, history, any of these things. They've got a very limited view of intelligence. They think intelligence is a, is a binary code. So a lot of the things they're creating are full of biases, full of cultural biases and extreme limitations. So these are some of the problems that we need to be aware of in that whole situation. In this electronic age of voicemail, chat rooms and talking computers, the least valued of evolutionary forces is the human voice. Without it, little children cannot even learn to speak. So what is being valued here with exponential technology? Certainly profit. Silicon Valley is, is very wealthy and there's a lot of greed involved in developing these exponential technologies and convincing people they need them. But especially it's about undervaluing human qualities. It's, it's based on a technotopian worldview, not a human-centered worldview. So how can we help? What can we do? The pedagogies of voice help to keep it human. There's a whole range of them we spoke about before, postmodern and post-structuralist, aesthetic, artistic, poetic, critical and planetary educational approaches. And finally, lots of human voice. Talk to children, talk to young people. Let them talk amongst themselves. All of this helps them to find their voice so it empowers them. That's the pedagogy of voice. It's empowering. So summarising today's talk, We've gone through a lot of evidence for evolution of consciousness. We've looked at the two main streams of evolution of consciousness, cultural evolution or cultural history and adult developmental psychology. We've explored these transdisciplinary pedagogies of love, life, wisdom and voice and how they help to develop the post-formal reasoning qualities in adulthood. And finally, we've looked at how we can embody these core values in practical ways to meet those major 21st century challenges that we're all facing. So if you're interested in any further reading on these topics and themes, I've written The Post-Formal Education, A Philosophy for Complex Futures. It grew out of my PhD and it really expands on all of these things that I've talked about today. Also my Oxford book, The Future, A Very Short Introduction, is uh, looking at the many aspects of futures thinking, including 3,000 years of how humans have thought about the future, the evolution of the future studies field. I look at how we can compare and contrast technotopian exponential technology futures with human-centered futures and how might they complement each other. And finally, I focus on the grand global futures challenges and what we can do about them to turn them around. Lastly, The Secret to Growing Brilliant Children is my book about Steiner education for the 21st century drawing on my practical work as a Steiner educator and a lot of my academic work in contemporizing the best of Steiner education for the 21st century. So thank you so much for your time and um, I hope you enjoyed watching and listening and uh, I, I hope you enjoy the rest of this amazing transdisciplinary congress. Thank you. So yes, that was absolutely wonderful presentation by Jennifer Gidley. And she is anything but a robot, even though we've had to bring her in by pre-recorded video. Uh, I so far haven't seen questions in the chat, 
So um, I'll just say that Jennifer's work over the years has really truly been on the forefront of exactly what we need to be dealing with today. And her heart and head have been asking questions, which we now understand is the complexity of what we need to be focused on. I don't know, Maria, if you would like to comment or if we should just move to Terry's talk, if you would unmute yourself. <clears throat> the microphone, Maria. I think that we can move to Terry's presentation. Okay. So I will now introduce Harold Terry Lindahl. The microphone, Maria. So it is my pleasure to introduce Harold Terry Lindahl to the transdisciplinarity community. Terry is the president of the Entropy Equals Entropy Institute in San Francisco. He is an artist and architect inspired by the laws of sacred geometry and organic architecture. Along with many built projects, he has over the years pursued parallel interests in the laws of thermodynamics, where the conflation of empirical research culminating with the revelations of Einsteinian physics, Darwinian biology, and the contemporary revelations of Gnostic research coalesced into an authentic and unique 21st century vision that is namely his bringing together the revelations of the past hundred years where Einsteinian relativity, Darwinian evolution relative to a humanistic valuation of the human instinct of religion can be understood as a natural phenomenon. Lindahl is the author of The Harmonics of Unity and Endogenous Semiotics of the Vegas Pineal Gyre, which was published in 2017. And we are very pleased to be able to offer a Spanish and Portuguese translation of this book, either by request or through the Congress website, thanks to CTRANS Brazil. I'd like to just say a few words about <clears throat> how our institute got started. We are located in San Francisco on Potrero Hill, which is on the south side of Market. And formerly, as you see, it was a movie theater and it has been transformed to the building that you see on the right through Terry's ingenious <clears throat> architectural experience and a group of non-professionals. <laughs> it is now housing a exhibition of art, which is open to the public to come and visit. These are watercolor studies, sculptural, So Terry, um, if Ivan is ready with to work with you. <clears throat> Terry, you need to unmute yourself.
We're ready for a liftoff. Is that right? Okay. Um, so we've heard the aims. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, what's called what we call the post simian pre homo sapiens conundrum. That is to say, uh, the, the conundrum uh, that that um, we must, we must uh, uh, solve before we can actually uh, realize these dreams. The <clears throat> situation is, uh, in the study of humanology, that humans are three-brained. Uh, we have a reptile uh, in us, and we have a mammal in us, and we have this uh, whirly gig on top called uh, the intellect, the human intellect. Uh, these three information processors have to begin to be able to speak to each other and influence each other in our decision-making processes so that one brain goes one way, the other, the other, another, the other. And not much can, I mean, life goes on and, and everything will continue to solve itself the best it can. But it seems like we're at a, at a, a turning point here. And that was sort of addressed by this difference between uh, formal and post-formal education and so forth. So, uh, We'll begin by um, addressing this post-Simian, pro-pre-homo sapien conundrum. And these are graphic representations of the difference in terms of the information processor of the post-Simian to the information processor of the pre-homo sapien. So, we begin by establishing the, the, what seems to be the actual conditions of our situation uh, by locating ourselves in the universe. And so, we have a series of what we call three world diagrams. Uh, that lays out the different ways we've looked at ourselves and brings us up to date to address this uh, uh, Darwinian, Gurdjieffian, Einsteinian uh, conflation. So let's, uh, let's begin with looking at, at the situation humanology, explicating the pivotal place and purpose of humanity. So we, we address the universe. It is working. The universe is working. The galaxies and stars, the biosphere works magma, earth, and sky working. And here in the breach, the onus of existence, the on us of pre-homo sapiens. The on us. In a time-charged issue, the ergodic dynamics of particulate intercourse ordered by the first law of the experience of existence, amassed galaxies, suns, and planets. And on particular planets, the second law of the experience of existence, ordering the biological processes of feeding and breeding, 
our refining mass into the vibration rates of caring and thought. The on us, ordered by the third law of the experience of existence, completion processes are asymptotically refining care and thought into vibration rates that mitigate the pressure of time on charge. Impartial conscience and objective reason. So the three world diagram has a basis in philosophy. This, this diagram uh, on the screen is uh, Roger Penrose, but it's been commented on by pa uh, Karl Popper and Charles Peirce. Uh, did a good deal of uh, discovery on this of a three world situation. So uh, Penrose had the platonic mathematical world, the which uh, evolved to become the physical world, which evolved to become the mental world, and he has the arrow going back to the platonic world, which means that there's a completed circuit, an ergodic circuit completing itself. But we disagree with him on the direction of the third arrow. So uh, this is, we call this the thermodynamic properties of this ergodic armature. <clears throat> The, we're, some, some charge, unknown, just charge, creates a vibrational world and through transformation processes, the firm phenomena, the mass and energy, uh, create the stars and planets and on the planets, uh, the biosphere. And on the biospheres, there's the transmutation process that brings the reversal of mass energy to energy mass of fine phenomena such as thought. And that transpiration, the transpiration then to vibrational world is a, a, a digestion, a reverse of uh, process of the digestion of the cycles that came around to make this energy mass situation a fine phenomena as a digestive process of everything that took place to release the energy that the uh, that the sun has mortgaged to the world our world as a transpiration of our experience of fine energy uh, to back to the solar system. So we, we uh, continue with the series of uh, diagrams here to show the various ways that this works. So charge, the transformation of coarse mass from fine energy to minerals, is gravity bound. The transmutation of thought from minerals is re bound by reproductive processes. And the transition from intention to charge, we call the transpiration of conscience from refined thought is intention bound, that it is requires a the intention of humanity, the third brain, neocortical property that makes you humans occupy a very special place in, in the solar system. So there's the, the diagram and we have the evolutionary processes, evolutionary process, uh, and e cybolutionary processes. So cognon clouds and galaxies, star systems and sun, 
<clears throat> then evolutionary plantae, animalia, human, and evolutionary processes, entropic transpiration of fine grained rates of vibration. This is the methodology of the ergodic armature. The is how is the, the energy of is mass is conserved in <clears throat> planetary processes of, of maximum entropy. The Evolutionary processes, the what is the refine the inner, the information from phenomena to produce entropy. Entropy is the uh, offset of of life itself, of eating, of taking in energy from the outer world, and through intelligence works to offset the descent into deeper, deeper entropy. So that process, the process of why, why it's to return the energy of charge through the digestion of information. So academically, we have physics, studying the involution, biology the studies evolution, and religion studies what we're calling cyvolution. That is the evolution of our psychic properties. So these are the elements. Uh, so uh, cogno, we say, is the medium through which photo photons can travel at uh, the rate of speed. That, and <clears throat> magno, electro, chemo, thermo properties produce the biology, which uh, derives the instincts, the archaea, the protista, fungi, plantae, animalia, and the psi evolutionary, which produces the intuition, thought, morals, imagination, conscience, reason. So the layout here uh, gives us a, a, a sense of how it, how it is we exist in all of this. So, Coming to the emblem emblematic revelations, now it, around the turn of the century, 20th century, uh, Darwinian research had produced the idea of, of the evolution of species. And shortly thereafter, Einsteinian research produced the theory of relativity and at the same contemporaneously, Gurdjieff was developing the intention brown processes of impartial conscience and objective reason, which are the processes that, that can bring together all of these very intricate processes so uh, let's let's dive into the actual situation uh, of this address of the post-Simian pre-Homo sapiens conundrum. I need the text. Yeah. 
there we go. <laughs> uh, humanology. An apodictic premise for extending our humanities program to include a college of self-knowledge. Now, this is presenting some ideas that need uh, some special words. So we have a small glossary. Uh, Self-knowledge, the experience of normalizing our innate reptile, mammal, hominid, sensibilities. Cognum, the semiotic medium binding the normalization of phenomena, consciousness. Post-simian pre-homo sapiens, the present stage of biological speciation. Cyvolution, the intentional evolution of psychic properties. Natural religion, the refinement and transpiration of the energy conserved in humanity. Entropy, evolutionary force of experience normalizing the entropy of existence. Infomass, material consisting of the normalized interactions of energy and mass. So with those concepts, we could address the place and purpose of humanity. Solar energy, mortgage to planetary batteries, charge a global bi biological membrane, enzymatically refining minerals, atmosphere and light to the vibratory vivification of sentience, air, and unique to humans, thought. Barely balanced, with one foot on bacteria and the other in the Library of Congress, we invoke the turn of the 20th century convergence of Gnostic and empirical information processing stemming from the initial experience of the inner course of energy and mass, millennia upon millennia of the interplay between more heart than head Gnosticism and more head than heart empiricism reached a far from equilibrium paradigm criticality as these lines of information processing auto instinctively converge to unconceal the concordance of relativity, evolution, and the human instinct of religion. Through this convergence of Gnostic empirical information processing from pre-Renaissance post-Simian to post-Enlightenment pre-Homo sapiens, we address the experience of ourselves as biped, three-brained, biological apparatuses refining and transpiring our mortgage payments. Uh, what? I just lost. All right. We have a little problem with the my inexperience with clickers, clickers, and so on. It's with, uh, so we are paying back, uh, paying our mortgage to this to the solar processes. So the pre-homo sapiens inversion of post-simian thought. Addressing the post-simian pre-homo sapiens conundrum, recall Boltzmann. The biosphere normalizes the temperature differential between the sun and outer space.
and Margulis. As prokaryote discovered oxygen and cannibalized prokaryote, indigestible infomass coalesced. Indigestible. What was <laughs> energy that was generated from the digestive process, infomass coalesced to form the nucleus of the species eukaryote. Such speciation processes brought fungi, plants, and animals to the present process of the pre-homo sapiens cannibalization of post-simian inframass. The coalescence, of <clears throat> the coalescence of the indigestible truths of our Aristotelian disciplines formed the nucleus for the evolution of Homo sapiens from pre-Homo sapiens. Include then Gurdjieff. The human organism is a three-story chemical factory with the potential for a large output. And we add output for the counter-evolutionary process of cyvolution or religion. These, can, <clears throat> these recognitions place humanity as the on-point process working out nature's ergodic program. The beleaguered process by which the coalescence of bacteria produced the Library of Congress has brought us through the Renaissance and the Enlightenment to the completion dynamics of the modern era. Emblematically, the coalescence of the infomass of Thales, Socrates, Lucretius, Jesus, Galileo, Newton, Kant, Curie, Meitner, Darwin, Einstein, Chardin, Schrodinger, Whitehead, has unconcealed the dynamical organs of the natural religion. The biosphere is the religious organ of the solar system and humanity is the religious organ of the biosphere. Neath the systematic violence of the garden of civilization, the destruction of trees for homes, or for machines and the destruction of brains for computers flows the biological violence of the enzymatic destruction of minerals and atmosphere for energy. That is, we eat and breathe. Humans come and go saying, my life and life is precious. While the experience of the enzymatic refinement of energy from mass by the organ of the biosphere and the organ of humanity is being transpired to the normalization dynamics of solar realms. Post simians processing the information conserved. in the phenomenon of minerals, atmosphere, and light, refine energy to the vibration rates of care. <clears throat> refine energy to the vibration rates of care and thought. Pre-homo sapiens, augmented by educational programs, Augmented by educational programs, refine the information conserved in the phenomena of care and thought to innervate the evolution of Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens, through the cyvolutionary education of the triune tier of their moving, motive, mental brains, will, in agreement with natural process, yield the highly refined properties of impartial conscience from care and of objective reason from thought.
from a pagan circle dance to a pagan cyclotron. The processes of relativity know the world, evolution, know thyself, and cyvolution, self evolve, are modern iterations reifying the common intuitions of pre common era information processing. Know thyself. The kingdom is within. Separate the subtle from the gross. Know thyself. This obscure summons stems from the biological instinct of human aspiration, an endogenous force of evolution. It has little to do with knowing your likes and dislikes. The post simian tendency is to know about ourselves as objects with a name, rather than to know from the processes of our reptilian, mammalian, human selves. The religious instinct to learn more and be better, that is to refine information, involves the evolution of the disparate complexity of our moving motive mental information processors relative to the properties of our appetites, ambitions, and aspirations, which we experience through sensation emotion, and thought. The pre-homo sapiens' summons to self-knowledge involves the intentional conservation and through the process of self-knowledge, the intentional refinement of the energy spent on the tilt-to-wheel deliberations of emotional associations relative to rational associations relative to your natural aspirations. Know thyself. Children of the intercourse of energy and mass, we range between delight and despair as we pass through the quotidian trials and occasional celebrations of our planetary rounds. But further, if aspects of your chemistry and your education agree with your religious instinct and you find yourself with the aim to know yourself, recognize the wonder, but exercising caution, steer clear of mysticalism and spiritualism. Feel your way to what your nature thinks and think your way to what your nature feels. In your search for natural information, be wary of emotion alone or intellect alone. The history of human aspiration is compelling, but it's probable that its fantasies and its institutionalization have done as much harm as good compared to the natural processes it displaced. The kingdom is within, a solemn augur, indicating that for humans, no matter the exigencies of their without lives, parasympathetic pineal information digestion processes conduct the life of the kingdom within. The occasional experience of the ineffable energy of self-recognition, a moment of self-recognition, whether from an idea or a premonition, charges the kingdom. These self-recognition moments largely go by unremarked, but when understood and intentionally cultivated, 
moments are the key to the cyvolutionary reconciliation of our disparately internecine information processors. Just as in their time, the biological species Plantae and anim Animalia normalized their ecologies, in our time, the latent potential of the pre-homo sapien psychic organs of intention and attention are in the breach. But naive, having evolved without, without right information, the energy of the without desire cannot catalyze the intentional desire of the evolutionary within. Only moments open the way. Cyvolutionary processes, nevertheless, are a simple matter. Intentionally extend natural digestion processes to the digestion of the energy from the waste matter of daydreams. It requires the development of a cogent intention and a coherent attention. The least examination of the state of your intention relative to the state of your attention. Oh, no, you might as well be in a madhouse. The intention to experience the blending of the energy digested from the madhouse initiates the within system capable of recognizing and processing the ineffable to the without vibrational frequencies of our religious instinct. The evolution of a coherent attention field relative to the point intention to experience the breath, experience the breath as breath, intentionally permeated by the vibrations of intention, naturally blends with the blood to vivify every cell. This process is the natural distribution system conducting the experience of evolution. Separate the subtle from the gross, gently with unremitting care, advises the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. A solar mandate enzymatically separates psychology from ethology. That is, evolve the three brain survival response of conscientious reason from your one brain reptilian and two brain mammalian survival reactions. The biological digestion of energy from phenomena reached criticality through the evolution of caringness and thoughtfulness and charges the evolutionary process of self-examination. Under the pressure, pressure of the concomitant evolution of the neocortical properties of intention and attention, these evolutionary properties normalized the criticality. Cogent, coherent vibration rates then are the stem substances through which the evolutionary reification of the comity of impartial conscience and the polity of objective reason become the source of governance. Moments. Our animal nature does not self-examine but the microprocesses of neocortical properties, our properties, receive self signals from the solar biological processes that propagate the ergodic fulfillment dynamics 
of the macro process of which it is a part. These moments, when understood, initiate the experience of our religious instinct and the process of self-examination. Self-examination leading to the self-digestion refines the energy wasted by our reptilian mammalian instincts and augments the transfer of energy to the innervation of the reblending properties of conscience and reason. When sufficiently sivolved, the experience of reblending energy by the frontal cortex alerts the cerebellum and enlists the limbic dynamo to assist the blending of the energy with the ontogenetic history of sacral reproduction energies and innervates the solar plexus expressions of cogent, coherent information processing. Some might call it creativity. Animals, our animal chemistries will persist, but their voice experienced now by an attentive medium is taken as a source of moments, the recognition, a moment of recognition and the intentional ignition of the circuitry of the fulfillment dynamics of the ergodic M armature. These processes are recondite. And to engage their, engage these processes from a sense of right information requires schooling, requires a work with others pursuing the similar processes and brings about the proposition of a college of humanology. The chemical persistence of reptilian ego and mammalian ego diabolically and deceptively will insist that their voice is the voice of your earnestness. The laws of cybolation are more rigorous than the probabilities of evolution. Therefore, falsifiable and repeatable experiments classified through population statistics are nigh compulsory. The science of humanology begins with establishing that I am where my attention is. I'm sitting here, but my attention might be in the refrigerator or for that matter on the moon. Perhaps it's in my emotions. Or my sensations. Or in solving a problem or whatever interest happens to be firing my synapses. The transpiration of our hypnotic experience goes on and on, and by stochastic probabilities, so do naturally occurring signals from the instinct of my cybolutionary or religious nature. In summation, a million rotations, 50K, 10K, the speciation properties of information processing produce the question, what is the meaning of life? And coalescing information at the behest of our intrinsic instinct has clarified our condition. From circle dances, to cyclotrons, the normalization of our speculative endeavors 
were focused by Renaissance humanism, enlightenment, and modern deconstructivism until, with nothing to hide, we stand gloriously naked. We are biological cannibals refining energy from light, atmosphere, and minerals. And while the energy of our experience of information refinement pays the mortgage, the waste is deposited in civilizations. And we will carry on. Civilizations will carry on. The built hardware exists. Our laws, our arts, the morals, only the software is under examination. So out be from behind the eight ball, so to speak, the bright cabal would not ask the population of the earth what they believe or tell them what to believe. Adopting a hundred or two year project employing all available communications, literature, movies, songs, college degrees, revision of the lyrics of the Christmas carols, and without prejudice, without prejudice, gently continue to filter in more and more information that agrees with natural processes. So thank you, <laughs> and uh, so are there any kinds of questions? Any comments, what uh, we've seen, uh, we've heard what the aim is, and we've heard what the, what the problems and solving getting to that aim are. Uh, what, uh, what can we say to each other? Thank you, Terry. Uh, there, there is a lot of applause. Oh. Uh, both on the chat and with our panelists. And I'll have Maria unmute, but there, um, I mean, most comments in the chat were supporting how your proposal brings hope in these very difficult times. And that the intellectual and spiritual delight is in fact the function of the transdisciplinarity movement. Uh, one question from Adriana in San Paulo, part of C-Trans, uh, she asks, what are we experiencing in our existence and experience at this time that could bring about a more refined transformation of our being? I suppose she's referring to, for instance, say the pandemic or the crisis. Is well, uh, <laughs> we uh, what what uh, what it seems like uh, is necessary is that. Uh, and, and it's, it, it's I, I call it a hundred year project. It might be a 500 year project, but uh, we have to, so to speak, turn around. Now, the, the problem is that, uh, please excuse me, I, I'll just be blunt. Uh, Catholics believe one lie. <laughs> Islamists believe in uh, their lie and Buddhists live their life. You see, the great traditions are, are all pre have presented us with a story that's so, there the, the intuitively is true, but the way it's been interpreted 
uh, it, it's caused major difficulties throughout the centuries. So here we sit and with your question, what could, so there's no, there's no uh, quick fix. We have to begin this project in, uh, of the evolution of our psychic properties. Our, the separation of our psych, psychology from our ethology. Uh, because the ethology has this fierceness, and, uh, both in reptiles and mammals. Uh, so how to uh, uh, bring their instincts into sync with what we need to accomplish your question. Uh, Well, I know Maria has prepared um, a few questions and if she would unmute her mic, um, we might proceed with her response. And so I turn this over to you, uh, Maria. Well, well, Linda, um, let's see if I will be able to put it on words some impressions I received from your talk, mm -hmm. uh, which are now uh, reverberating in me. Mm -hmm. um, the time here of your talk is very short for us to listen to, listen to all you have to say. But yeah. I will be very brief in my comments. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, three points I would like to address. The first one is the thinking framework you presented is very complex, yes. dynamic, multidimensional and multi-referential. What makes it genuinely transdisciplinary? You mentioned experience of experience, the energy of refinement of organs, and the dynamics of self-knowledge and care. As it relates to language, uh, your use of it is concise, dense, intricate, even cryptographic. In <laughs> um, <laughs> You coined words such as evolution, entropy, and presented notions of entropy equals entropy and encapsulate a lot of meaning in words mm -hmm. that might not reach the, the inattentive listener or reader. Uh, I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> Example, in some of your charts, you use the word armature instead of structure, a yes. term to indicate the transformation of electrical energy in mechanical energy. Exactly. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I, I tell you, <laughs> in your talk and text, it's never to be encountered the emptiness of words so common in the sloppy use of speech and writing nowadays. Mm. Now, as it relates to your art, you bring to see a, a poetic thinking, not a calculative thinking. Mm -hmm. no. You articulate artistic expression, science and ontology of highest expression. You demand a lot from the person that listens yeah. to you. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, and cultivation of being transpires in each point of your message. But I have some questions for you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, well, uh, I have uh, very few questions and um, I grouped my questions in these this three 
parts, your thinking framework, your uses of language, and then your art. In the light of your thinking frame, framework, the, uh, I wonder what are the cognitive, cognitive resistance you encounter in the effort of bringing this thinking to practice in individual evolution process? And also, can it be operative in collective experience as we face now in COVID-19 pandemic? This is one thing. In relation to language, I would like to listen a little bit more of how do you equate, you equate language and being as an emergent shining experience of all experiences. And what is the role of technology in this respect? If there is a role of technology in this respect. Uh, and in regarding to your art, in what extension may creative art processes and work of art be eminent practice of moments? Because you, men you mentioned practice of moments. Yes. And also experience in transformation, transpiration or transpoesis, not only to the artists, but also to those that access this art. And then I have a postscriptum about religion, and I will add it here and then lower it all well, yours. Maria, Maria, would it be okay uh, if Terry answers first those three questions and then? Okay, fine. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot, right? <laughs> um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, listening to all three of them, that I got, got to separate them out uh, sufficiently. But um, um, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know where my language exactly comes from, but uh, uh, I, I, I sort of take, approach it as an architect. I uh, uh, I don't uh, follow grammar necessarily. Uh, <laughs> uh, I get beat up plenty for that. <clears throat> and but I I sort of create from the background of art and science because I've really spent you know at least forty years with the lay studies of. Of physics and thermodynamics, and uh, uh, of Penrose, and and uh, just uh, I, I've been uh, in con I've met with uh, Harold Morowitz and Stuart Kaufman and and Lynn Margulis uh, and Basarab, and we've you know so we developed uh, I've developed a kind of I call it scientific poetics. It's not poetry, it isn't science. <laughs> and of course, uh, we have to begin to understand, I believe, that uh, technology has, um, uh, the scientific method and technology have clarified what the, is, is, uh, what the solar system, how it works, what we're doing, and that no matter where we send a spaceship, we find the same laws. So <clears throat> uh, we have to thank them. But now uh, this idea of, of uh, uh, impartial conscience and objective reason uh, has to begin to regulate technology and regulate uh, uh, capitalism and regulate socialism so that there begins to be an agreement, uh, 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 perhaps, perhaps and uh, there can be an, uh, something that spreads into uh, the global community because all these religions were invented when there was no global community, so to speak. So, 
Uh, I hope that addresses some of what you were speaking yeah. about. <laughs> Do you want to bring your postscript now, Maria? Postscript, <laughs> my God. Uh, this postscript has to do with uh, religion. Um, your talk transpires religion as yes. really body uh, in many points. To me, religion, religion is really gary encompasses really religion as really gary encompasses world and being in the world, taken in its ontic and ontological realm. And the most uh, sacred experience uh, in the process of unconcealing what is being a, a human being, mm -hmm. uh, we get to a point where it seems that just being is. And uh, to each to immerse in this experience of being as beauty, mm -hmm. uh, perfection, and freedom. And, and um, you, as you already posited, uh, the religious is an alchemical path where uh, flux and flow and uh, a continuous refinement of energy takes place. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, this experience with being part of a, a religion as an institution. Correct, yes. You know, so, mm -hmm. and, uh, my or, mm -hmm. and my question is very simple. Is this, besides uh, in relation to religion, this type of religion I mentioned, religion as religari, besides intention, attention, presence, practice, do you include in your understanding of religion uh, also an effortless openness of having the ultimate experience of religion just by grace, blessing, yeah. and uh, despite the despite uh, of despite of ourselves, and yes. you know, uh, you're, uh, I believe we'll see if, you, but you're uh, addressing what I what we uh, we call moments. Uh, of, you see the. Uh, the mystery of these moments is that uh, they present us with an ineffable experience uh, of opening to something, and, and we uh, we no, we can process that mostly mostly not much at all, but it, it does produce something in us that that is um, that. Uh, excites our religious instinct, or I agree very much and, and use the word religarent uh, a lot. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, religio, the, the tie back, you see, so it's uh, uh, religion is, is the return of energy to the source of the energy which is an, an entropic, entropic process dealing with the entropy of existence. So that's religion. Now, uh, we've made a, a mishmash of it in all kinds of ways, but uh, uh, it, it, it just is, the, it begins with, the, it's, it's, it's the cultivation of these moments of this experience that you're talking about, so it's the daily, it's, it's uh, cultivation, it's it's the hourly. I mean, it, it, we have to develop an inner, coherent, vibrational medium, which we call attention. The intention, intentional attention, is what can process these moments. So, but we don't have that. We have effectless in intention and uh, desultory attention. And we're doing, we, we're carrying out nature's intention, but we have, we have the, the onus of be, being, having our, uh, our, our, an attention that agrees with 
nature's intention. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Okay. Um, wow. So the next part of the program, if uh, Stephen is there, I'm going to be uh, introducing Stephen in a moment. Um, but uh, we're going to do something um, which is a little different than a paper. Uh, so I'm going to go to my screen share, the scary part of screen sharing. <laughs> Let's see. The conversation that we <clears throat> are going to share three ways between Dr. Stephen Porges and Harold Terry Lindahl and myself is called the science of being, moving beyond our natural attitude. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Porges um, came to San Francisco, was it a year and a half ago with his lovely wife, Sue Carter, to view the exhibition of Terry's uh, gestation history and potential of man, of humankind in San Francisco at the Institute. And if, you heard Dr. Porges's keynote address on Wednesday. This will be a repeat of his bio, but I encourage anyone who didn't to look at Wednesday's YouTube channel for the recorded talk, the keynote address. Dr. Porges is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University and is the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium, president of the Society for Psychological Research and Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. He has authored numerous articles and lectured extensively about the implications of modern science. In 1994, Dr. Porges proposed the polyvagal theory, a theory that links the evolution of the mammalian autonomic nervous system to social behavior and emphasizes the importance of physiological state in the expression of behavioral problems and psychiatric disorders. He is the author of the polyvagal theory, neurophysiological foundations of emotions, attachment, communication and self-regulation, the pocket guide to the polyvagal theory, the transformative power of feeling safe, and he is co-editor of the clinical applications of the polyvagal theory, the emergence of polyvagal informed therapies. He is also the creator of a music-based intervention, the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is used widely among therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, reduce hearing sensitivities, assist language processing, and state regulation. In recent years, the polyvagal perspective has spread beyond the field of trauma to other disciplines. Mm. We as a society are in the process of realizing we communicate through our nervous systems as much as our intellects. So this is the gestation history and potential of humankind told in seven octaves of seven aspects, seed, native virtue, indulgent, searching, school list and listening and evolving man, which um, is in the lower level of our building. 
And when Stephen visited, uh, I, part of this conversation will be, I think, reflecting on how Terry's art transmits visually the science of the polyvagal theory. And here I borrowed a couple of Stephen's slides to show how he has been thinking about uh, Terry's India ink drawings of the three centers in relation to the vital organs of which the vagus is the conduit, the gyre. Mm -hmm. And when he viewed um, the pensive and vis vigilant sculptures to nine foot high by five foot diameter aluminum core sculptures. Um, they symbolize in relation to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic functions of the autonomic nervous system. Beautifully, I think, in relation to these anatomical uh, drawings, which um, scientists are using to teach um, the polyvagal implications. So, uh, Stephen, if I were to ask you to start with the homo hypnon state <laughs> um, as an indicator of the first level um, would you read Prigogine's quote for us? I, I certainly will try. At equilibrium, molecules behave as essentially independent entities. They ignore one another. We would like to call them hypnons, sleepwalkers. However, non-equilibrium states wake them up and introduces a coherence quite far into the equilibrium. <laughs> okay, and I will read um, what Husserl said for the second state, which is the essence individual. Before the epoge, I was a man with a natural attitude and I lived immersed naively in the world. I was a transcendent ego, even while in the natural attitude, but knew nothing about it. In order to become aware of my true being, I needed to execute the phenomenological epoge. And I'll have to, uh, Terry now read what Rajiv had to say about the third state. The human organism represents a chemical factory planned for the possibility of a very large output. But in the conditions of ordinary life, this factory never reaches the full production possible to it. There is, however, a possibility of increasing the output. For this purpose, it is necessary to create a special kind of artificial shock. An artificial shock means a certain kind of effort made at the, at the moment, at the moment, when an impression enters our consciousness. Now, uh, Terry, I'll have you, if you wouldn't mind, um, letting our audience know something about the somatic refinement process, which you've illustrated What Prigogine's um, quote in relationship to the food diagram. Mm -hmm. uh, Is there something? So that... can we bring the food diagram onto the, or? Do you see it there? I see, I see part of it there, but you need the whole thing to. Well, it's. Bring that on and block out the type. Well, um, this is the way the slide is prepared. Um, no, just it needs to be on the center of my screen. 
because it, and um, Ivan, Ivan, no. maybe can help. Again, can you not see? That's how it is. We'll move this. Okay. Is that better? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was better. We don't need this because it's right here. Okay. Now, what's the uh, what the what this what this food diagram is is called the somatic refinement of entropy. <laughs> so, this is the way the organism processes uh, food, air, and impressions to. Uh, finer degrees of vibration. So uh, Gurdjieff adopted the, uh, a, a table of hydrogens, which uh, conforms rather closely to the periodic tables of science of the vibration rates or the atomic uh, number of uh, uh, different properties. So uh, we have the digestion of food, the red, the red uh, line producing uh, enough energy, enough fine energy to reproduce our organism. And the, there is enough air to uh, oxygenate the blood and enough uh, impressions to keep us uh, in touch with our <clears throat> sentience. Uh, now, so this is, this automatically, this nothing here is up to us. We, we do this automatically. But uh, what we're interested in, in order to achieve some of uh, uh, Jennifer Gidley's and, and Maria's questions <laughs> is the next diagram. So we, mm -hmm. so we, we talk about a person who uh, addresses the process of, of uh, self-knowledge and, and is uh, Carrying out the the uh, inner development, uh, which comes about when we make this uh, in, intentional effort at the moment of receiving uh, an impression. So, if the if I am processing that moment, uh, if I'm able to resist the, the animal impulse to reinsert itself instantly over any foreign element. And, and this uh, ineffable energy is a foreign element to the animal, but it's the human element for us. So if we can uh, uh, process this fine energy, then the impressions octave goes to 12, the air octave goes to 12 and the food octave is already at 12. So you have a unified 12 energy, not, not, uh, not topographically, topographically lapping, but individually inter intercommunication at the same level of, of uh, vibrations. So that brings about the state of being that we call an essence individual, somebody that has his own mind and can uh, do what he intends to do and so forth. So where do we go next? Well, put this off the screen. This is impossible. Nobody can do it. <laughs> 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 okay, Homo sapiens. Uh, so, uh, 
so uh, these three 12, you know, these three inter uh, uh, in interacting vibrations uh, are there, are installed, you could say are in uh, uh, situ in our kingdom within. And from these processes, impressions that arrive can be uh, impartially uh, processed. And from this impartial process, we can reason objectively. So one of the examples of that is the, the uh, story of, of Solomaic judgment. In, how do you solve intractable problems and so forth? Uh, so this allows us to begin to operate as responsible uh, citizens of the solar system. So I would just like to invite Stephen sure. to have the first response. Well, thank you, Susanna. <laughs> so the first question or first point I want to make is that everything, I mean, Terry gave a beautiful presentation and it makes a lot of sense, but it may, it's predicated on an assumption and the assumption that the system functions efficiently so that you can have this evolution because mm -hmm. if the system is in a sense under defense or threat, Exactly. You don't have evolution, you have dissolution of your exactly. No. So, and this is, you know, so you have a wonderful model, including when you start talking about the efficiency of metabolism, the efficiency of energy chance. Right. right. That's all mediated by mm -hmm. a system that can maintain a homeostatic state. And that's also a metaphor, really saying it can efficiently process mm -hmm. and translate that energy. But if you put the system under stress and well-defined under threat, right. the parameters are going to change greatly. And you start a deconstructing or decomposing or devolutioning. Right. You start getting more <laughs> okay. primitive people. So that's why the evolution of consciousness, the evolution of society has not been linear because there have been these disruptions. Totally. Oriented. oriented. And when we talk, and this actually goes back to the first talk, the first talk really was all about, in a sense, logic thinking and formal processing. How do we structure our educational system? Right, right. The underlying foundation is we make it safe for the individual. We That's right. The body from having to use its resources to defend. And then we get into actually everything that Terry talked about, right. which is this efficient way of translating energy into consciousness or thought process. But I think as a society, we've really screwed up. And whether yes. we utilize metaphors like religion as our narrative of excuse, we have to understand what they were used for. There's a functionality to it. Right. And that functionality is not towards uh, individualization, creativity, self-regulation, it's all That's about right. <laughs> which is a devolution and not an evolution. Right. That's the lie. <laughs> well, I'm still saying we're, we're, we're propagating <laughs> no, no. the lie. Uh, excuse if, my jocular nation. Uh, if, I, I couldn't agree more with you. You this you. Uh, so, uh, but let's let's uh, the the reason I feel that uh, this psi evolutionary process. Which, which, is, which is not an invention, which uh, happens, I mean, this uh, moments of self-recognition happen a lot, actually, but the, we don't recognize them as for, for what they are. So we go on hypnotically, but uh, when I can recognize these and... and uh, this, uh, this process, evolution, isn't called that in, in the uh, community that I belong to, but uh, there, there are 
it is a scientific condition that, that can, that answers to all the falsification processes, predictability, uh, explanatory. So I'm, I'm trying to say it is a real thing. And I don't, I, I'm not saying you don't agree. I, you, 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 you did agree. So we're agreeing with each other and finding uh, what, where the, what is the line of, uh, pro, of uh, processing being human. Yeah, uh, let me uh, interrupt yeah. a little bit and say- Sure, that no, no. The, the process, I'm in full agreement and I have my own metaphors to describe it, but mm -hmm. we have a major problem. The problem is contemporary society. Yes. Whether contemporary society supports that process or will injure you if you're involved or committed to that process. And I speak that way as a being an academic for more than 50 years. Right. It's not a safe environment. And just remember, in most of our environment, we're under evaluation, whether we use the term education or if we go in for our health. We are evaluated. Our bodies are placed in a That's chronic right. state of threat in situations, whether it's to maintain our health or to, in a sense, enable us to intellectually grow. Those are, in a sense, states of reactions to threat do right. not serve our consciousness well. It doesn't serve our body no. well. It doesn't serve being a human well. So yeah. it's a violation of the principles of how humans should treat each other. Yeah. So uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, we, could, we could refer them to uh, Prigogen's uh, homo, I mean, uh, <laughs> hypnon, hypnotic life processes where the reptile disagrees with the mammal and the mammal disagrees with the reptile and they both disagree with what uh, the rational is telling them. And they're under stress constantly and not, nothing is possible. Uh, no receipt of this finer energy yeah. is possible in these conditions. I couldn't agree more. And uh, uh, to, to support if what? there, I, uh, this is my solution to, to it because, okay, <laughs> uh, we have to, Edu start a school of, of uh, a college of humanology that is teaching this to people that are interested. When you go to when you go to college, you pull out the, the, the syllabus or whatever it is, and you select. Oh, I want to go to the college of humanology, and you go and you attend class and so forth. And this process is taught. Mm -hmm. So if we teach enough people on that level that could then begin to uh, pursue their careers in education or whatever. Well, I, 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 this, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with you, but I'm going to, in a sense, kind of retune what you're saying. Oh, good. <laughs> the, the problem, when we use the word teach, immediately we go into a cognitive model of mental exercises. And what, I think what you're really saying, if you want to be a human being, you have to understand your underlying physiological state, which translates into the world of having feelings, being embodied. That's right. Because the educational That's right. process is a process of disembodiment, okay. rejecting the feedback from our body that's giving us information. And that's why we get all these so-called psychosomatic illnesses, but they're not exactly. just psychosomatic. It's our nervous system telling us we're not supporting it. That, exactly. So... This cyvolution says, I uh, over a, a number, you know, we're talking about a way to live here. We're yeah. not talking a quick, you know, seminar that cures everything. <laughs> but uh, I learned to live more attentively. Now, the way to do that is by adopting aims, sincerely adopting an aim to let's say, uh, I'll count three, once every 30, 30 minutes. You, you, as you see, so uh, then, and, and uh, this, this uh, Gurdjieff way is called the way of failure. 
because you you will find you can't do that, <laughs> and you'll see I, I, and I, when there when that happens enough, there begins to be something inside that recognizes that I can't, and uh, then you, there's a, there's a there's a whole processes of of uh, how you increase the vibration rate of this in, inner sense. Uh, but the, uh, the process is that there is a, that when my, somebody uh, speaks to me, friendly or not, uh, my reptile immediately decides what there, what's going on there. And then the mammal tries to say, oh, well, you know, and, uh, and very little rational process yeah. comes, comes in there. But if the, if the uh, intellect is vibrating at the rate of the reptile and the mammal, then the, 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 you can set up the situation where the vibrations of the reptile are received in the inner system and and you have to bear, you mm -hmm. see, does, it, does this reptile agree with the mammal, agree with the rational? And I have, and, and the, this, inner, this inner energy is uh, uh, operating at a speed that it can include, can include all those. So that's what 12 energies speak about, is, is the, the ability to let the reptile and the rational uh, influence each other so yeah. that's what I hope hope for <laughs> well I'm going to change the language and carry the same underlying metaphor mm -hmm. you're basically exercising feedback systems in your body and you're honoring what the body the receptors the mm -hmm. uh, the efferents as you call them of the body yeah. and not rejecting them and our society is about rejecting bodily feelings so that we can free our cognitive functions from their responsibility or their influence from the body. So <laughs> well, the, the, the other point that's very <laughs> relevant to what you were saying is this concept of neuroception, which is a term I developed because I didn't want it to have a, a level of perception or cognitive awareness. We respond to cues in the environment. Some of the cues are threatening and yeah. some are cues of safety. But exactly. there are a million in older systems that we share all, we all respond to threat, but what's unique to mammals is that they reflexively, outside of awareness and outside of consciousness, respond to cues of safety. And homo we, hypnons. Yeah. When we I mean, do that, hypnons, not homo. Yeah. Right. When we do that, we create accessibility. Of That's right. People, we become safe with each other. We co-regulate, and then okay. the evolution. Can process. is possible. I, I, I agree. And that might be the moment when uh, uh, things have been going wrong. And I, I happen to take in the movie like The Matrix. <laughs> and I see something, you know, uh, and, and it touches me in a, in a way that's meaningful, not just as an entertainment. Yeah. Or, or I read a poem by Thomas Hardy or, or uh, even Jesus wrote some fairly beautiful poems and, mm -hmm. and the information he, he gives, I think what the, one of the things he said was you can't pour new wine in old bottles, right? You, you see that's, uh, I mean, it's too bad that Christianity doesn't know that. But <laughs> <laughs> but, Go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say that the adaptive nervous system model is it doesn't like violation of expectancy right. it right. gravitates to what it can predict Absolutely. so putting old wine in new bottles is this notion of predictability and this notion of going back to that quote by Piergerson Pier that I wrote mm -hmm. the disruption to that system is critical for the system to reorganize and mm -hmm. change its level of energy or right right but the nervous system has another, in a sense, protective mechanism in saying that violation of expectancy is potentially threatening. And that 
that but this is it says also the basis of humor if you watch a so, baby yeah. dance move, it's a violation of expectancy within a safe environment with the mother so what we already know is what's part of the curriculum for for your new college is yeah. violation of expectancy all the time within a safe environment there are no wrong answers but so, well put <laughs> within the spectrum of what terry was saying earlier is the gnostic research and the empirical research where we are today in a very pragmatic way everything that your research Stephen has brought we recognize is not necessarily self-evident to individuals so the if we're for instance going to make a recommendation to UNESCO at this point and say we need to upgrade how higher normative levels of learning can be obtained. Mm -hmm. The lecture that you gave on Wednesday is the 101 course of humanology mm -hmm. That's right. uh, that would be offered as an adjunct to all the humanities, mm -hmm. as you pointed to the overlapping areas of the transdisciplinarity that's naturally involved with what um, I referred to, you know, and you have as well, the scaffold of what polyvagal theory brings us. Then we also have your polyvagal institute, which is working on another front of outside nonprofit work that is, you know, meeting the corridors of education and communities, education in trauma, education in politics, all these areas. And so we're starting to be able to infiltrate what are human rights based on not just principles of philosophy and so on, but actually what Husserl was moving towards, what Merleau-Ponty in terms of we ourselves are the phenomena. And Terry's work, with his exhibition, at which you saw, would be worth commenting here about what kind of tool you feel that would be, say, if it were at Stanford University on view as a teaching complement to your science. Yeah. What I'd like to, uh, actually I'm going to jump in a little earlier mm -hmm. before you said that, and that is when I give talks to clinicians, they will come up to me afterwards and they'll say, oh, what a, what a marvelous talk, I learned so much. And I'll look them in the eyes and come on, be honest. Yeah. You, didn't, you didn't learn anything. Mm -hmm. What you did was have your intuitions supported. Mm -hmm. And that's this point that part of our visceral reactions right. are giving a sense of safety that our ideas right. are the area of education, there are educators very interested in creating safe classrooms for the kids. Safe classrooms doesn't mean that teachers carry guns. Safe classrooms are the cues of safety are being given to the children. Uh, likewise, intensive care units. You have to think about what's going on in the medical world. It's all about surveillance, cleanliness, and billing codes. So you have to go into the intensive care units and realize how noisy and disruptive and chaotic they are to a nervous system that is already so challenged. So all, it, all the energy, all the information is a threat. So how can the body heal itself? And the problem is medicine still hasn't come to the point of really understanding that it's the body that heals itself and their job is to make the body feel sufficiently safe Save. to earn its resources for replication right. and healing. That's medicine, but uh, well, the, medicine you see what, what, the, what is destroying the, the, the possibility that you're uh, offering is the fact that this reptile is in, in, in a room with 20 other reptiles. And <laughs> you know what? Right. No one's, so, no one's there to enable it to be a mammal. No right. one's there to give right. it the cues. Oh, give up your vigilance. Give up your defenses. I'm there for you. No. You see, this is why I'm saying that it's, it must be a 500-year project or something. We, you know, we've been on this earth 
for oh. what was a billion years, <laughs> something like that. But but Terry, if you realize, if you think of that, uh, let's say those pathways and the diversions from the pathways of let's say evolution, the pathways have been very uh, consistent. They're about leadership that wants power and acquisition, and not about leadership that wants connection. See, that's not evolution, though. It, it's not allowing evolution, is what I'm saying. It's, that's right. what doesn't allow it. Yes. It, yeah, uh, it, it, but it's giving us that information that so it's not like we don't know what needs to be to happen. You talk to people, uh, you know, if as you talk to them and say, look, I really would like a safe world. And they'll say to you, then the people will be lazy. They won't do anything. Right. Yeah. And I'm saying you want uh, a safe world that encourages boldness. And the, on, the only the only uh, hope we have is that. Our religious, you know, we are religious animals. Yeah. And, and well, religion is not a, an added on. Yeah, religion let's change that. I, so you're going to have to clarify. Do you mean okay. spiritual or do you mean religious? Let's say it again. Do you mean that we're a spiritual uh, species? No, we're, we're not religious. spiritual. There's no such thing as okay. spirituality. Everything that vibrates, vibrates. It's got mass. There's nothing. Just we have to eliminate these words, spiritual. <laughs> so we uh, we are mechanisms refining energy. Yeah. So uh, we we can we can uh, we can create a safer place of that discuss that point. Uh, that for sure. We can uh, say that our interpretation of those vibrations. But who will? Energy. How will it get down? You see, what I'm talking about is pr promoting a program that will teach people that can teach the program. And, and uh, you know, how, how did quadruped become biped? <laughs> it's on that scale. <laughs> well, and also when we start talking about uh, laterality and shared responsibility and uh, specialization of... All America. that comes, excuse me... Uh, I'm saying all that comes when I have a coherent conscience. I don't have to put any values on it. Nothing I've ever th that anybody's ever thought of matters. The conscience will guide my actions, and I, I'm sure it'll come out <laughs> very much like the. You know, we we have moments when we recognize the values, but. So, uh, so, Terry, what I've been working on yeah. is in my understanding of evolution and how I use it, mm -hmm. I, I see it as pushing, uh, it's, a, it's a journey towards sociality, which is a journey towards connectedness. Now, yeah. what does that lead to? It can, it can be the foundation of a evolution. It is not evolution. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because the safety and accessibility. Right. What evolved is three disparate internecine information processors. And what Cyvolution uh, brings, brings uh, an inner communication. Yeah. That, See, uh, I would give you one more uh, since, uh, okay. a tool to use within that and mm -hmm. say, yeah, there are three sources of information, but right. the, the, uh, the Homo sapien has actually this circuit that enables those, uh, basically places them into a hierarchical system. The system functions hierarchically when Absolutely. safe. When yeah. not safe, this, this falls apart. Right. But when safe, you have the sure. hierarchy which exploits the best of all three. We, we have to eliminate hierarchy between these information processors. It's a terminology because I think you're misinterpreting. I'm not yeah. saying it depresses or suppresses. I'm saying it coordinates. So it, okay. it, All right. it, it but, exploits to the best mm -hmm. uh, these other systems without allowing them, I'm gonna use the word allow, yeah. of those systems to go into defensive states. Because once they're in defensive right. states, then no. the energy gets dissipated and no exactly problem. exactly exactly so uh, we'll put uh, uh, we'll put up our core our college of humanology 
and the person will get their syllabus. And how many will sign up? <laughs> well, where do we begin, in other words? Uh, well, think about this for a moment. Yep. Think about the syllabus as, as having uh, basically foundations and the initial foundation. Absolutely. Is absolutely. Experiential, right, totally right. experiential. So the person yeah. becomes re-embodied. And yeah. with the gift of re-embodiment, where do you go with that? And uh, um, I mean, is there? Uh, how can we? I mean, what we're what we're talking about embodiment is not something we do. Uh, it's something that we recognize as possible. And we, I redefine that. I say it's something we allow to occur because no, uh, no it's out, it's going to occur no matter what you think. <laughs> well, the issue is, is again, it, this it, is a line as now. at the, at glacial timelines. It, it, it's the the issue is not our society thinks that everything we do is intentional, without yeah. an understanding of what I would call the emergent properties of what it is to be a human. And yeah. this is part of what has to be in your college, an understanding of what are the properties of being a human and how we compromise right. those by spending our resources literally in states of defense and threat. But yeah, uh, we can look at where we are right now. If you walk into a classroom and you mention the vagus nerve, there usually isn't anybody who is even aware that they have a vagus nerve. So the fact that your work has given us an owner's manual to how the psi evolution or the phylogenetic history is the basis of our evolution and that we are humans in quotation marks until we begin to understand the three centers and move from there um, or already that will be a tremendous help to education to understand why the conflicts, why the post-Simian conundrum of, of um, our dualities, and then the transdisciplinarity movement, which carries the philosophy of logic of Lupasco and the hidden third or the potential for the emergence of the third force in us that is of the emerging. religious force <clears throat> right then um, you know those are principles that guide the embodied practice that all art schools for instance are working towards and craft and in in uh, participatory experiential work in performance art or you know and then we move scientists in the direction of feeling Etc. No, no, no. We cannot have aims like that. Uh, no. No. You you create this inner uh, being. the The kingdom is within. So you create so this inner being, and it. Uh, we you see we make no we can't invent anything. We make no decisions. Everything is, is Schopenhauer. If man can do anything he wants. He just can't want what he wants. We we and uh, we're in the position to process and not to invent. Or so how to allow exactly these this uh, inner process that can uh, include more and do better for. The, yeah, I, I but, would, uh, but I just want to say we need your work is is essential foundation to everything that I'm talking about. You, you I would say through your work you produce can, candidates for psychoevolution. <laughs> is that too? Wow. Well. What, what I would say is what I've learned from my work is that yeah. the core of humanity is lovely. 
The issue is how do we allow the core to be expressed? That we are so concerned with the wrappers, the defensive shields around us, that we don't allow the core to be expressed. I use the word don't allow and I'd be careful yeah. because people listening will think that it's an intention. But what, what, what you're saying is exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of room to work together on this process. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted myself. <laughs> well, thank you, Terry. And I'm learning. And thank you, Susanna, for bringing me into this unusual. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank, <laughs> thank you all <laughs> so much. So, so hope to see you soon. Yes, I do. Yeah. I think our audience is um, mostly speaking Spanish, so unfortunately, I'm not able to translate the comments that I see. They're not questions, but I think they're all supportive of the effort of trying to come to something where education itself can now begin to adapt and recognize the contemporary understanding of our conflictedness um, as defense machines or as you know the way we still feel a great need to protect ourselves rather than become expansive and bold and creative in our environments of learning so forth. So, Maria? I yes, see you uh, waving your hand. Uh, um, well, uh, in the chat, there are people saying that they are very much inclined to study what you two have uh, proposed these days. And of course, that will take some time to integrate and then to see how it operates within themselves. Mm -hmm. And also, the second step, how they can be transferred to their areas of, uh, uh, of uh, activities. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very, very good. So they will need, they will need more, uh, more resources to, and uh, also dialogue and to, to see what it's all about. Right. Another point is that uh, that was raised in the, the, the chat. Uh, it, it, so Dr. Ford is saying that isn't there possible that sometimes in a very unsafe, uh, unsafe situation, uh, because of the need of uh, salvation, it's necessary uh, an integration of, uh, of uh, that happens an integration because of the stress exactly. and because of the, the challenge of the situation was so great that you're, because of unsafety, you have to find a new, a new stage of being safe. Is that, it possible that, that it may occur? Well, let's be very careful about describing this because the answer is yes, but there basically yeah. few people who can do this. Yeah. So okay. if, if you're under that type of situation and you literally fragment and can't do that, it's not okay. to be blamed. The issue is that there are, the term is like, there are the stories of survivors in concentration camps where when I, when I, when I start developing the theory, I had forgotten about Viktor Frankl's book, which I had read uh -huh. graduate <laughs> And I had this whole, uh, almost mechanistic worldview that if I create a safe environment, everyone would be wonderful. And that meant that if the environment wasn't safe, everyone would be taking care of them, basically uh, trying to survive. I yeah. forgot about, quote, the angels. And there are people who function like angels under the worst situations. I yeah. talked to uh, the Association for Foster Parents. And I was at this meeting and I met angels. So I met people who took uh -huh. into their homes with an open heart, really challenged and difficult kids. So yeah. you see this, that there are some that can do this, yes. Yes. But it doesn't mean that I can do it. Some people are uh, really uh, decent mammals. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's really remarkable about uh, the compassion and benevolence and generosity that's within our species. And yeah. we have to celebrate that yeah. more than we do the acquisition of stuff. You know, more money, more uh, grants, uh, bigger right. houses. We have to really, uh, in our culture, realize that the generosity of being a human being 
is beneficial to one who's even being generous. You get a lot back. You redefine who you are. It makes you feel better. Uh, <laughs> on that glorious note, I'm going <laughs> to... Uh, 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 there are a few remarks that uh, still refer to Jennifer that I would like to point out here. Um, the Joseph would like, uh, uh, is interested in carrying on with Jennifer a dialogue about uh, Lupasco's concept of consciousness. And uh, I think that is uh, where we can, where we can uh, forward this, uh, uh, his interest to, to Susanna also. Uh, I was there, there was to ask about the strategies Jennifer proposes to students to recognize their own voice and listen to their own voice uh, before they are able to interact with others and the voices of others. So there are, there are, what, they were interested in understanding a little bit how she deals with this problem. Mm -hmm. This is Ad Adamo. And there also, there's another person. Uh, well, let's, let's, uh, Maria, let's yes. address this one, voice. Yes. You have to have your own voice. But you have three different internecine voices all the time, automatically. You can't, have, you can't talk like that. You have to talk about the processes by which I could have a voice. Okay? That's, so that's my answer to that. There is a prior integration to be done. <laughs> yes. Let, let me jump yes. on that one. Yeah. Um, in, in the me mental health field, we, they talk about parts. And this is a right. topic, Terry. But if you take the parts and put them within the polyvagal theory, you have a part that's integrated and socially interactive. You have a part that's uh, basically threatened and aggressive or fleeing all the time. And you have a part that is shutting down and withdrawn. You, yeah. So you have these different sure. parts Absolutely. that represent the physiological scripts right. of our ancestors, of our vestigial mm -hmm. ancestors. But they come out and people use the term working with their parts. So Terry, the voices are the parts within the mental okay. health world. Yes, we will use that metaphor, sure. Uh, and also, <laughs> Silvia, Silvia, also from Brazil, in the chat, she would like very much to, to, to know if uh, Jennifer has examples of projects uh, that she is developing and uh, where she can access these projects that she is developing. And-, um, and Can uh, I answer that? Could I answer that? Um, yes. In, in the chat, I have put Jennifer Gidley's website and her email and anyone can write to her directly. I have also put the Entropy, Entropy Institute website and the Polyvagal Institute website so that this dialogue can continue directly to the speakers. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, there is one, one more question uh, uh, that is Victoria placed, which is, and she would like to know, uh, it's also direct to, to Jennifer, but it's, it's good that all the audience can hear it. Mm -hmm. she, she, she's trying to know uh, how to create st strategies to improve the exercise of voice in schools, because not, it's not only that you have to have a methodology for that, but you have to have specific strategies. Absolutely. And how do you constitute, and even to implement Terry's uh, humanology, it's not only the content uh, that you have to, 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 trans to transpire, but you have to have specific uh, strategies. And I think that we yeah. lack these strategies in the transdisciplinary work in general, mm -hmm. uh, because you have, the, you have the epistemology, you have the methodology, and you have a, a lot of content, mm -hmm. But we lack strategies specifically because these are, are this is a kind of uh, knowledge that applies not only to schools which have a, a certain realm, a certain uh, way of dealing with education. But if you go to an enterprise, if you go to a, a hospital, if you go to a doctor environment, the strategy has to be different. Yes. And so this is a very important issue. 
also to deal. You, so you our, so our, in, our institute in San Francisco is prepared to work on the program initiative of which we've already developed a certain degree of how we think it might go. We obviously need to speak to deans of universities who run humanities departments to ask them how the software of the present hardware could be adapting to Stephen's uh, research that indicates that we actually carry a human right, a human obligation towards bringing this information. And of course, uh, as Stephen, as you've you know, always indicated in your um, faces of Shiva, you know, it, 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 you know, we can recommend, we'd like to require, <laughs> but we can recommend for those who are willing to, you know, see their onus, see their obligation to begin some pilot programs. If we can offer yeah, of course. Let, let me jump on. I think Rickeri's going in the same place. You can't push this on anyone. If you do that, there it, it won't work. They have to want this. They have to come to you once they know it's there. And right. that's how we grow. Yeah. Right. So we're there and you're there. And we're hoping that things, it's, you know, a World Congress like this can begin to help us shape what people are asking for, but what people very much would like to see as a change within these major institutions. Small schools like art schools, for instance, mm -hmm. are struggling against the big technology companies wow. to stay alive. And yet we've had a very integrated kind of program um, where there's flexibility right. around boundaries of teaching. Well, let's see if we can find a way to approach the universities. Uh, that's that's way I feel we have to begin. Have to teach the teachers that can teach, <laughs> but it's through offering, not you know. It, uh, how do we put it? We we uh, we love to learn, but we hate to te be taught. <laughs> so we, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, so uh, the the program. There is a way ahead, I think, and I'd like to pursue it uh, with the help of everybody. So uh, I appreciate very much this opportunity to speak with you all. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Terry, and thank you for integrating or allowing me to be challenged to join your family. Uh, <laughs> no problem. We're the in a parallel way, we are working with our Polyvagal Institute to develop educational materials for yeah. different, uh, let's say, niches. Right. So one is in a sense, business organizations, hospitals, clinics, right. different uh, specialty groups. What we're trying to do is have them come together and tell us what they want. And then we will work <laughs> the type of teaching materials for them. Uh, I also you, want... you, there's a preliminary step there. Yeah. You have to feed them the information that tells them what they want so they can tell you what. Exactly. They have to be, <laughs> it has to permeate their world. Right. And, 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 and the final comment is really the insights that you have had, you know, my, my sincerest appreciation and respect to translate it, not just words, but into art, uh, where the art carries uh, what the physiology is, has taught me and my own personal experiences and the clinical feedback that I get all the time when I work with different groups. So That's Carrie. very gratifying. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So there are many people asking in the chat, and I just want to reiterate that the Congress website will eventually be carrying PowerPoints, papers, and the lectures are recorded so that um, outside of writing to me directly for information that they're requesting, um, the Congress website itself will be making this information available for, is it a year from another year? 
uh, live? Two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. so thank you all. Thank you very much. It's been a think, most um, yes. Uh, be um, before you finish, I just would like to mention that uh, Julieta, which is well, the, the organizer of this Congress uh, uh, from Mexico that it has been working like hell to put yeah. it together. <laughs> and uh, um, she, she was very much impressed with uh, the presentations of today. And the, she, she said that it's, um, it's going to be very important to have this content in the, the context of the whole Congress and that pop, the people will profit a lot from it. And so she would wholeheartedly thank you, you and Jennifer, you both and Jennifer uh, mm -hmm. for this contribution. And um, so uh, she, she understands English very well. She understands French very well. And she understands Portuguese very well. She's, but uh, she has a little bit of difficulty in speaking it. Yeah, but I see. Yeah. Followed it attentively. And she sent me many, many messages saying, how wonderful, how great. <laughs> I love it. Oh, we nice. have to go on, you know, we have to, to, to see it again. We have to go over this material again. <laughs> Julia, look forward to it. Julia, <laughs> we hope uh, in one year we will all be able to come to Mexico City and give, yes, you, a hug, and give you a big hug. <laughs> 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 and uh, if we could go across the street and have uh, a glass of tequila, <laughs> we would do that right now. <laughs> Fine. So. Very good. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Yeah, and thank you, Susanna. You're Thank very you. welcome and have a good weekend, everyone.